Hi, this is Jay Richards. We're here at COSM 2021, uh, the conference in Bellevue, Washington, uh, with Discovery Institute and George Gilder. And I am joined by my friend and Discovery Institute colleague, Gail Pooley. Gail, good to see you. Great to be here, Jay. So you just sort of ended here the first day here talking about the stuff you do so well, talking about abundance. Give us a sort of brief summary of what you said in the session. Yeah, so what I try to describe is just uh, when we look uh, at the uh, time prices of things, and a time price is, is really just the time it requires you to earn the money to buy something. Mm -hmm. When we use that approach to, to look at what uh, prices have done, you know, from a perspective the last 40, 50, 100 years ago, what we're seeing is all of this abundance occur, where it takes us less and less time to earn the money to buy more and more of, of goods and services from basic commodities mm -hmm. to, you know, we think about iPhones and the right. high tech stuff, but it, we, we just see it everywhere. This so abundance that's so, emerging. So this is a, essentially the time price is a way of measuring abundance. And instead of talking about a, adjusted price or prices adjusted for inflation, it's the amount of time it takes to buy a particular thing for the average worker. Right. How okay. much time do you have to work to earn the money to buy a gallon of milk? Okay. And then yep. you compare that over time. Is, you have to spend more time or less yep. time. And if you look at the rate of change in that time price, that's really what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And that, I assume, and that doesn't even take account of the fact that the product itself might improve, right? Right. So you take these basic commodities that yeah. aren't changing, yes. and it's like, we know that these, you know, like a Ford F-150, yeah. that changes over time. <laughs> right. It's not the same car as it no. was in 1980. That's right. But if you take basic commodities, bushel of wheat kind of a bushel yeah. of wheat. And so we see that this abundance is actually showing up, this innovation really, this additional knowledge. That, and what we like to think about is George has described this idea mm -hmm. that, that wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, and money is time. Well, how do you measure the growth in knowledge? Yeah. You can measure it with time. Okay. So when, when things get cheaper for you, it means that they're really there's more knowledge in an economy. Yeah. That's why they become less and less time expensive gotcha. for you. Because time and attention, those are just, those are fixed scarcity, right. right? We're never gonna get more minutes in a day. Yeah, and Tony Stark, you remember he yeah. says, uh, his dad says something like, no matter how much money you have, you can never buy a second, second more of time. He's recognizing that, that time is fixed, yes. but, it's, uh, but it's also continuous. That's right. Everybody gets 24 hours a day. That's right. And so if you could do more with less time, yeah, that's the idea. Right. And so that's a way of measuring abundance. It's an right. incredibly fruitful idea. And I know when you first did it, you were focusing, as you said, on, was it 50 commodities? Right. 50 basic commodities, which right. I guess, did you pick those it, it, largely because, first of all, they're, they're common to everyone, but also because it's a kind of a standard right. measure. As you said, a bushel of wheat doesn't change that much. So we actually, our initial inspiration was this bet that, that Julian Simon and Paul Early had, and famous. it was five medals. Yes. And from 1980 to 1990, mm -hmm. and, and we said, well, would, would he win that bet today? And one of the uh, uh, criticisms of that bet was it was only these five yeah. things. So right. we expanded it from five to 50. So we okay. included items from energy, from food, mm -hmm. from these materials, like what's it cost to get a two by four? Yeah. What's it cost to get, you know, 100 pounds of cotton? Mm -hmm. And then we also looked at minerals and these metals that were included. Yes. And we go back to 1980, the date that they okay. started. So we got this 40 year history of 50 items. So our wow. data set gets much larger. The World Bank uh, also tracks all of these prices. So you got this good, solid source of data. I see. So we can go to the World Bank, get yep. all of the prices, look at what, it, what wages are, mm -hmm. and take the, the money price, divide it by the wage, and that's how much time it takes. Well, so, but you also talked uh, a good bit about the high-tech stuff. So you talked about the iPhone and uh, Mac yeah. Classic and things. So what, what's the point there? Because obviously that's not a commodity, these complex uh, sort of high-tech Yeah, so, uh, so those were really seeing these big change and all this new knowledge is right. really changing the product. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this huge abundance occur there. And that's part of this idea of, of that George talks about, yeah. learning curves. And the reason that we're able to actually increase uh, you know, make these products, and, and, and like the iPhone, the price doesn't seem like it goes down, but right. you get twice as much. Oh, heck yeah. You're getting yeah. twice as much, right. so the effective price is going down. At the same time, everybody's 
hourly wages growing up, so what's it cost you to buy an iPhone today? Even though it's twice, 10 times better iPhone than it was in 2007, it actually takes you less time to buy it. Yeah. So, yeah, there's yeah. no doubt that the current iPhone is, is significantly yeah. better at, at, at the sorts of things that it can yeah. do. But you also had this analysis because we tend to think of these high tech uh, products that have made certain men fabulously wealthy, people like Steve Wozniak and the late Steve Jobs. And we sort of we focus on that part of right. the equation, like oh, that guy became a billionaire. But you did this analysis of the amount of value created for the company right. and then for customers. So what's going on? So I actually didn't do the analysis. Yeah. I actually, uh, Nobel Prize winning yep. economist William Nordhaus wrote this paper and he was talking about shum, uh, uh, shumpatering profits. And yes. uh, the economist talked about innovation. He said, when this innovation happens, who benefits? Mm -hmm. And so Nordhaus tried to quantify who gets the benefit. Okay. And he came up with the number of Producers, the actual innovating entrepreneurs, keep about 2.2% of that value. Wow. So the, the customers are getting 97.8% of the value. Yeah. So it's like a pie that's got 44 slices, and, and the guy makes the pie and he gives all of the, he yeah. keeps one slice and he gives all that that's value right. away. And he created a pie that grew a whole lot. Right. And the customer's <laughs> like, they didn't take any of the risks. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't. So, yeah. You know, yeah, it's amazing the way you yeah. sort of analyze this because you initially think that. I think, well, how do we calculate this? But one way of calculating it, you said, is to well, ask somebody how much they would right. be need to be paid, for instance, right. never to have another iPhone or a smartphone. Or for me, never to be able to do search on the internet when you're doing research. Yeah. That, that would actually be a lot right. of money. What would you be what would I have to pay you to give up that? So That's right. you know, in economics we're always looking at reveal preferences. Yes. Like how much would you give for this? And people say, well I'll give you twenty dollars for the pizza. Mm -hmm. And it's well somebody else will give you sixteen. So we're trying to figure that out. That's one way to figure out the difference between the price and what someone values it as yeah. to say, well, you, you actually, when you paid twenty dollars, when you paid fifteen for the pizza, but mm -hmm. you thought it was worth twenty, you got like this five dollars worth of profit, right? Yeah. Well, one way you can do that is instead of asking people what they would pay for it, mm -hmm. is ask them what you would have to pay them to give it up. Okay. And that's, I think, a better approach to take yeah. when you're talking about these devices that people. That makes sense. People buy, they pay a thousand bucks for it. Well, what was it worth to you? And they say, well, I paid a thousand for it. I know that's what you paid for yes. it, but what's it really worth to you? And the larger question is, what would I have to pay you to not use it? That's right. And, you know, the reason that iPhones are, are so cheap is because we got a competitive market. Absolutely. Right? It's competition yeah. that makes it yeah. cheap, not. Not Thank because, goodness for those right. Android phones or we might be yeah. in trouble. You know? and, and, and I think also Apple, you know, they can yeah. move along with these. We have these, these really large fixed costs mm -hmm. to, right. to create these products. And then the marginal cost is really low. Right. So it's like, what do we have to do to be able to, to cover these fixed costs? So when you have a population of a thousand people, Oh gosh. That's a lot different than when you have a population of a million or a billion people. That's right. So a lot of these products really complicated to make but the market is so big that you can actually, you can become profitable. Yeah, you can spread those, those right. fixed costs out over and 10 then, million products. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing that I can get a pill that costs me $2, that costs a billion dollars to make. That's right. And I get it for two bucks. Yeah. How is that possible? Because <laughs> there's so many people on the planet. Yeah. Well, you uh, really emphasized at the end of your talk, I would say, uh, not a kind of naive optimism, but hope. Uh, and of course, that's that's a sort of theme of Cosm 2021 is are we headed toward doom? Or are we headed toward prosperity and abundance? And you had, I, I think, a really interesting perspective. And we were talking about, OK, what is the source of your hope in the future? Is it uh, technology? Is it laws? Is it people? What is it? You know, one, I think as you look at this perspective and, yeah. and going back to when we first did this analysis, we expected to, to find some of those 50 items mm -hmm. We expected to find some of those had gotten more expensive. Sure. We thought, well, if one of these items on this list of 50 is more expensive today than it was in 1980. Not a single one of them had gotten more expensive. So it was like, that's pretty hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the average, they dropped by 75%. Uranium had dropped like 89%. Totally counterintuitive because there are right. more people, right? right? So, yeah, this is why when people first hear this, they think, how could this possibly yeah, be? Yeah, how could that be? Yeah. And and then as you as you is you go through the, the logic of what does it take for these innovations to occur? Well, they begin with human beings. Hmm. It's human beings that are free to learn. Right. So if you add more human beings and you add more freedom, mm -hmm. then you should get more knowledge. Yeah. And that knowledge shows up in 
lower time prices. Well, and you said more human beings and more freedom. Freedom in this kind of rich sense of the American founding. Not just people doing whatever they want, right. of course, but uh, ordered people free, yeah. ordered free people in a rule of law and property rights right. and uh, ability to title property and patent. So you so it's not it's the person who's an innovator, but a person in different social settings is going to be capable of more or less productive. Right. This idea work. of a culture that that's this kind of solid. Do you have a foundation culture yep. that doesn't change, mm -hmm. doesn't cause static and noise? Yep. That gives you these basic fundamental. Do you have property rights? Do you mm -hmm. have a, a court system where you can resolve disputes? Uh, can you can you exchange things? Are yeah. these contracts enforceable? So if you if you can create that in your culture, then these other things. The low entropy carrier to speak in right. the yeah, as George is <laughs> yeah. speaking communications yeah. theory. That's the low entropy carrier, and then you get the high entropy so uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship yeah. and creativity. Entrepreneurs need government. Yeah, they need yeah. government to perform these functions That's that right. allow them to be creative. Yes, that's also an important takeaway too. I think is Absolutely. is you can't go into a situation that's anarchy, chaos, yes. and expect for entrepreneurship to thrive. So you're on the so you're on the optimist side, but it's not a it's not a techno utopianism. It's an optimism because of of your belief in that human capacities as creatures made in the image of God to create. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and uh, <clears throat> this creative ability uh, that. You know, I think people are happiest when they have they can do two things mm -hmm. that they're they can create and they can choose. Mm. If you yep. can if you're free to create, pursue your ideas right. and you're free to make the choice about what you want to do, people can do these astonishing things. Yeah. And we don't know who it is. Either. Right. We don't know, you know, the Steve Jobs thing is interesting because it's like there's how many Steve Jobs are in China or India or right. in Syria today? But we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know what their ideas are, but we do know that they're there. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's we right. do know that they're there. Yeah. Well, that's a hopeful thought. Yeah. Thanks, Gail. It's good to All see right. you. Good to see you, Jay. This is Jay Richards. Thanks for joining us. We are at COSM 2021.